All right. So my name is Emily Edmonds Langham. I am the new director of education at T Town, and I am thrilled to welcome you all to our virtual space tonight for our native plant lecture with two T Town alumni. Um, we have Ava Thaddeus who is a former elementary school teacher and environmental educator who's gardened in places as various as New York City, high deserts of New Mexico, and here in the Hudson Valley, learning a lot about plants and their ecosystems in the process. We were just talking about some really wonderful pollinator programming that she developed during her tenure as at, uh, at T-Town. So those are, her legacy continues even if she is no longer at T-Town. Um, Eva has been trying to restore healthy biodiversity for several years on a property that has been taken over by unwelcome invasive plants. And I think if we're all gardeners in this audience, we know that that is a difficult undertaking. So we're rooting for you, Eva. Um, and Julie Sutton is a lifelong gardener and nature enthusiast who developed a love of native plants while raising butterflies with her young children. Julia has been rewilding her yard since 2015 with pollinator beds, shade gardens, grassy slopes, and a backyard that went from turf grass to wildflower meadow. She also organizes a local native plant and seed swap community group. And sort of one of the most fun things for us tonight about this program is that both Eva and Julie used to work at T-Town. So we're happy to sort of welcome them back, albeit not in person at this particular moment, but we, uh, we hope to see you both on the property sometime soon. And with that, um, take it away. But as we, as we go, um, I will keep an eye on the chat for questions, but we will largely do those at the end. So Eva, take it away. <laughs> Thank you, Emily. Hello, everybody. Thanks for coming this evening. And uh, I am Eva, uh, one of the owners of Wild Gardens Nursery, and Julie, my partner, and I did meet at T Town, where she was the director of development at the time. And several years later, we both communicated to each other about our interest in starting a native plant nursery. So Wild Gardens has been around now, we just finished our first full year and we're opening again, April 22nd is our, our spring sale, 22nd through the 24th. Uh, T-Town also is having a plant sale coming up May 6th and 7th and they have a selection of native plants as well. So if you get inspired by some of the plants you learn about tonight, there'll be some opportunities nearby to um, to get hold of some of those. So I'm going to share my screen so I can start tonight's presentation about creating habitat with native plants. Okay. There we are. So that is the middle of the slideshow. Let's begin at the beginning. There we go. All right, can you see me? We good? No? It's still no. the uh, the video slide. Paused. Screen sharing is paused. Hmm, new share. Mm -mm. Okay, let's see. How are we doing? You're saying something different? Nope. Nope. Still the, there we go. Audubon. Okay. All right. But I got to get back to where I want to be. Sorry, everybody. Play from start. There we go. Yay. Yes. Excellent. Yes. Got a bird. All right. We got a bird and some black eyed Susans. All right. We're on. Creating habitat with native plants is what we're going to talk to you about today. And here's why it matters to do ecological gardening. First of all, because functioning ecosystems are necessary to sustain all life, including ours. And we're all becoming increasingly aware that the ecosystem is something that includes us as well. Um, as you know, our local ecosystems are facing various threats. Uh, development, climate change, 
And then our very uh, local issues of the overabundance of deer and their overgrazing on our native species and then the invasive species that are thriving partly because there are so many deer that um, prefer the native species. Um, ecological gardening matters because plants are at the very base of the whole ecological food pyramid and they're what make all the other life possible. So the good news for us is that if you have a yard or a garden, you can work at the base of our ecosystem by replacing, adding or replacing what you have with some of the plants that create habitat for the rest of the ecosystem. And so that's what we're gonna be sharing with you tonight is what are some of the plants that are the best at that. You've probably heard that insects are suffering. Um, it's been named the insect apocalypse and that's partly a scary name, but there really are huge declines in the number of insects. It's not known, it's not, it's not known what degree um, insects are declining, but they could be as, as much as half of our insect population um, could, could be gone and in need of our help. You've heard as well that birds are under threat and this is a report from Audubon. Also to really sound the alarm clearly with the bright red that um, climate change is a threat to birds and the, and the problems caused by climate change that have to do with habitat loss. We cannot, it's, it's really easy to feel helpless in front of this situation because we cannot directly have an impact on the numbers of insects or the numbers of birds and we can't bring insects or birds to our yards. But the good news is that we can bring plants to our yards, we can plant them and when they are there, the insects and the birds will come. So we can provide the food that the insects eat and that the birds eat and we can provide the food that the birds that eat the insects, that eat the food, eat as well. So by providing the base of the pyramid, then we help to build up the chain. And in, in um, case after case, gardeners have found that when they plant the plants, that suddenly the insects are there, they show up and that then the birds come as well. But why plant natives? Let's address that one now. So there are lots of plants that you can plant that attract insects. We've all seen like butterflies on zinnias, like monarch butterflies love zinnias and bees love to come to my, my cat mint. Um, why is it that we're recommending in particular native plants to help build habitat? Well, here is a beautiful stand of a non-native plant. I was at Longwood Gardens over the summer. There was this gorgeous, gorgeous array of this a, a Veronica and it was full of so bees and they're I'm like it's mumbling it's, to myself. It's totally a buzz with bees. And they're almost all honeybees, which is not what I'm used to seeing at home. Not all honeybees, but most, most. So I hope you heard the bees. It wasn't that important to hear what I was there sort of mumbling to myself, because I'll tell you, which is that I noticed that there were tons of bees and that most of them were honeybees. And that that was interesting to me because that's kind of different from what I see when I garden at home. Um, you probably know that the honeybee is from Europe and when you really stop to think about what that means, that the honeybee's from Europe and the honeybee makes honey, actually, really the honeybee is a domestic animal that was brought over to this country for agricultural purposes, just like really it's in the same category with the chicken and the pig and the cow. In, in North America, the, the honeybee is, um, 
is a visitor. And it's mostly a kept animal, not a wild one. We've been we, uh, very aware of the plight of honeybees for a while now. There was colony collapse disorder was a concern that um, about a decade ago was brought to the attention of everybody as, as um, honey uh, beekeepers opened their hives in the, the spring and you know col entire, entire colonies were dead. It was very dramatic. Um, and people were worried because bees are very important to us, to agriculture. This, the Bee Conservancy estimates that one in three bites of food are pollinated by bees between the fruits, the nuts, and the vegetables. So that if we didn't have our honeybees, that our food security would suffer. Uh, but there's more to the story. And with the increased concern about all kinds of insects recently, with the, the drops in insects populations that have been observed, it's come to public attention and more and more people are becoming aware that in fact, there are a lot of different bees all over the world. And that has become so much part of, of mainstream discourse at this point that the Honey Bee Conservancy itself changed its name to the Bee Conservancy. So after a decade as the Honey Bee Conservancy, they relaunched as the Bee Conservancy because they wanted to acknowledge that, that bee species all over the world needed protection and not just the honeybee. So it turns out that in fact, in New York state alone, there are 416 species of native bee. And they are all different kinds from teeny to the great big carpenter bee, which you probably aware of, um, and everything in between. They're different colors and they have very different life habits. Some of them nest in the ground, digger bees. Some of them nest in like hollow stems, the mason bees. Um, most of them are solitary. So the whole social structure that we think about when you, you think about the, the honeybee in the hive, most of these bees don't have that at all. They, just, they live on their own and they overwinter some hollow stalk. The bumblebees are, are uh, only native group of bees that are communal, but even they, they don't have the, as complex a social structure as the honeybee. One nice thing that this means about our native bees, which is really good to know if you're interested in attracting them to the yard is that it makes them less likely to sting. The stinging behavior is, uh, it's a protect the hive sort of behavior. So uh, honeybees are much more likely to sting than any of our native bees. It's not that they can't sting, they can sting. And if you step on them um, or, or bother them, they will still sting you, but they're um, not as aggressive. There's a wonderful website called Native Biology. If you'd like to learn more about our native bees of New York State, it um, was developed by uh, local educational um, or um, an environmental educator named Tim Stanley. And he takes beautiful pictures of all these bees. And so there's lots of information and pictures on the website if you're interested in learning more about them and starting to tell them apart a little bit. And it's tricky because there's so many and they, um, it's, it's hard, but you can sort of get to the different, at least the different categories of uh, bees if you want and start to kind of know what you're looking at. So going back, oh uh, yes, and this, going back to the bees and the domestic and the wild bees, this is an article that is all about bee preference. So again, why would we plant uh, native plants versus exotic, there is some evidence that bees, in fact, prefer native plants rather than exotic plants, meaning non-native plants. And when you think about the long evolutionary history of the native bees and the native plants, it starts to make sense that there are some baked in preferences there, some genetic preferences for the plants that they have evolved with over millions of years. So going back to my, uh, my Veronica plant, it was covered with 
it's a non-native plant that was covered with non-native bees. There were some, there were native bees there as well. It's not that they weren't there, but there do seem to be some, some preferences of, of native for native. And I certainly see that myself in my own garden that my native plants attract tons of native bees. And so that's, that's what I was there mumbling to myself about. As I looked at all those honeybees, I was saying, well, I don't usually see so many honeybees on my, in my own garden. I see uh, a lot of other kinds of bees much more. So this is a wood mint in my garden with a bumblebee on it. And this is a native prickly pear with a little green sweat bee. And it's all covered with these little green bees every year. The prickly pear has tons of these guys. Um, golden rods are always totally abuzz with bumblebees and all different kinds of, um, of native insects. If you're gonna plant one native plant to attract pollinators, goldenrod's like the very best of all. You can just see and hear that swarming with them. Oh. Um, butterflies seem to like a lot of different kinds of plants. They're a little, um, maybe not that choosy that way when they're a butterfly, but for the butterfly, what we have to remember is that they don't start out as a butterfly. So very important for the ec ecological gardener is to remember that insects need food in all stages of life. So not just nectar sipping stage, which is generally the adult stage. So not only the adults, um, insects need food, but also the caterpillar. And caterpillars are much more choosy in general than adults. So nectar, in general, nectar is sugar water, nectar is nectar, is nectar. but all leaves are very different and distinct and caterpillars have co-evolved with plants and eat um, in some cases, very specific kinds of food. It depends on the species. Some caterpillars will eat all kinds of things but some are very specific. And this is the monarch caterpillars that is famous for being uh, totally specific to milkweed. That's all it can eat. So in order to provide habitat, provide food for larvae. And if you're gonna provide food for larvae, you have to accept that they are gonna chew it up because that's what they do. They make, it's not as, it's not as picturesque as sipping nectar. Um, they're going to make holes in it and sometimes like really denude it for a while. So this was my milkweed after that monarch had been on it for a while. I find that usually the plant comes back. If it's a, if it, it's a mature plant, it can handle it. It'll relief. If it's a baby plant, you know, you might be unlucky and they might finish it. But if you um, plant several of them, um, then generally they'll make it through and provide food for the larvae as well. Here's a story about my pearly everlasting. So this Anaphilus margaritaceae, it's a native plant that's native to here and north of here, it likes sandy or rocky dry soils. And I had it in the, the second year in my garden, it came up in the spring and it was looking beautiful. I, I wish I had a picture of it in May, but it, it was this lovely light green color looking so incredibly gorgeous and healthy. And then about June, it started looking like this. It just suddenly looked like heck and it was all covered with this ugly webbing. And I was thinking I really should not have planted this here so visible. And I took a closer look at what was causing the problem and it was these caterpillars that were all over it. So I, um, I used my iNaturalist app on my phone and identified the caterpillars. And they were the caterpillars of the American lady butterfly. And when I looked it up on Wikipedia, it's what it said was the larvae feed on various asteraceae, such as the cudweeds, the pussy toes, and the everlastings. So it is one of the host plants for this specific caterpillar, and they had found it. And once I realized that, I felt completely differently about the webbing. And instead of feeling like I created this grotesque thing, I felt thrilled that it was doing exactly what it was supposed to do and it was supporting the ecosystem. And later on, a month later, the, the caterpillars were gone. They had turned into butterflies somewhere. The leaves had come back, the plant was budding out, looked beautiful again. And by August, it was blooming 
it's that white blooming plant in the back and looked beautiful. So that's the pearly everlasting story. And I wanna just finish my part with, if you don't know about Doug Tallamy, telling you about him. He's a professor at the University of Delaware. Um, he's a biologist and his specialty is in insect plant interactions. And he is also a wonderful writer and he's brought to prominence for the general public the importance of gardening for insects and especially caterpillars. And especially in the suburbs, he really focuses on the suburbs with his books. Bringing Nature Home is all about how the suburb is a huge, uh, so far missed opportunity to uh, rewild a lot of, of the East Coast with native plants. Um, missed opportunity because we have so much of this and this uh, has its purposes, but it's basically in terms of habitat, it's kind of an ecological wasteland. Uh, but, you know, especially if you're mowing it close all the time, not a whole lot lives in a lawn. And certainly if you're using um, uh, pesticides and um, herbicides on it, then it's, it's really a wasteland. But even if you aren't, there's just not much going on in terms of biodiversity or feeding anything. So that um, non-habitat can, or parts of it can be replanted with native plants that support caterpillars, that support birds, that will uh, bring the whole ecosystem into more vibrancy and vitality. So if you haven't read his books, I um, strongly recommend them. They're very good reading and they have lots of incredible photographs as well. He's a real uh, insect lover and he's got just these incredible close-ups of all kinds of cool insects that will make you uh, love them, which is like, that's, which is what the push of this decade, I think, is that we all are learning to love insects, change our, our point of view about them from pests to um, fellow organisms in our shared ecosystem. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Julie, who's gonna do the second part of this presentation, which is gonna be to share um, some of our favorite native plants and tell you a little bit about each of them. Great, great, thank you. So let me just share mine. And is that, can I get a thumbs up from that look? Okay, great. You're good. Um, all right, so um, I get the fun of talking about specific plants that we recommend, some of our favorites. Um, a note about this presentation, we selected everything with sort of a home garden in mind. So most of these plants don't get more than like three feet tall. At Wild Gardens, we love exuberant eight foot tall New York ironweed, but we recognize that it's not necessarily the best plant for everyone. Um, so most of them are under three feet. In, uh, there are a few exceptions and they're noted as such. Um, the presentation focuses primarily on flowering perennials and runs from spring all the way through fall. And then just a handful of our favorite ground covers and a handful of our favorite um, flowering shrubs. And as Emily mentioned at the beginning, we are saving a few minutes at the end for questions. Um, so feel free to put them in the chat or just make a note to yourself. Um, okay, so starting with spring, um, this is actually from my garden. And um, one of the things I've sort of changed since I started adding um, natives to my yard is that this area in mid-May is just spectacular. And then in summer, it's very quiet. It's just sort of green textures. So I've started, sort of choosing pairs of flowering plants that flower at the same time and like the same conditions so that I have more of a staggered approach. Um, this dwarf iris in the front um, is what we call a native neighbor. So it's not native to New York per se, um, but is located nearby. Um, and okay, so our first um, pair is uh, sundrops and eastern lupin. Uh, sundrops are related to evening prim or in the evening primrose family. Um, if you're familiar with the kind of roadside version, it's much taller and weedier. These stay nice and short, just a profusion of flowers. It's one of the first things to flower in my yard. I love my sundrops, very cheerful. 
Um, and Eastern Lupin, I imagine most of you are familiar with this plant. Um, it's not only beautiful, it's also really important. It's the only host plant for the uh, Carner Blue butterfly. So as you're adding plants to your yard, it's important to think not just about kind of generalist plants that support a, a lot of different pollinators and provide uh, host material for a lot of different insects, but also the ones that fill that very specific need. Um, red columbine, I think, has to be one of my very favorite wildflowers. And it's happy in shade. It's happy in sun. I have it in lots of different places. It reseeds itself nicely, as does golden alexander. Um, and you can probably tell from the picture, it's in the carrot family, which means it's a host for a black swallowtail. Um, these two phloxes you saw in that, in that initial picture, um, the woodland phlox is a little bit taller, not quite as dense uh, vegetation. So it's, I think, good to interplant with other things, whereas the creeping phlox really forms a nice carpet. And I just love this pink, the shade of pink. Um, these two are in the mint family. Um, the great thing about mints is if you don't have a fenced yard, uh, they're, nothing is deer proof, but they're quite deer resistant and not just great for their own sake, but great to put in front of other things that you wanna distract um, the deer from. So the hairy wood mint um, is a, a recent favorite. Um, there is also a um, downy wood mint, which is more of a lavender color um, and can take a little more sun. And the hoary skullcap, uh, I just added this last year and it's in a really dry area, but it's super happy. Um, so it's it, it's not a plant that I that I knew before then. And it has a um, cool like ballistic seed dispersal <laughs> mechanism. Uh, Virginia bluebells, uh, you know, there's a whole category of spring ephemerals that you know bloom nice early in the spring and then they completely die back to where you don't even see the leaves anymore. So again, nice to interplant with ferns or other things that will fill in. Uh, Heartleaf foam flower is just is such a nice textured leaf. There's lots of vari varieties of this one. There's, um, there's clumping, there's some that spread uh, more uh, in stolons and can form a nice ground cover, um, but it's just a, a very uh, cheerful plant. And then we get into summer. So we talked about uh, the importance of milkweed. So butterfly weed is a perfect milkweed for a typical home garden, stays nice and short, can be kind of bushy. Um, it's this really vibrant orange color and pairs nicely and blooms at the same time with um, the tall white beard tongue. There's a, there's a cultivar of this, or might be a variety of the beard tongue that um, called Husker Red, which has the red foliage. Um, from what I've heard, the red foliage is less likely to be used uh, as a host uh, plant. So it's great when, when you can stay with the straight species, it's great to do so. Um, there's also a, a hairy beard tongue, which is a little shorter and a, a light purple. Um, I can't, it flowers either slightly before or slightly after this one, I can't remember. Um, Eastern Blue Star, Amsonia, it has these beautiful dark green glossy leaves and these star-shaped flowers. Um, and this is another milkweed that I think is great for uh, a home setting. It does require a little bit of moisture, although I have it also in kind of average conditions and it does okay there as well. Um, and this is the, the three to six, the, that yellow text is just, you'll see if anything is marked as a little bit over three feet. There's the pearly everlasting that Eva talked about with its little special guest star. Um, it really was amazing how kind of beaten up it was and then it just completely bounced back. So I think there's this transition that happens as you start gardening for ecology and not for uh, aesthetics when you start to you know cheer when you see leaves that have holes in them. Um, it means you're, you know, it's working. Uh, the great blue lobelia is a great plant. There's also the uh, cardinal flower, which is a red um, lobelia. So if you have like a sunny, wet spot, they like a, a moist area, but they, they need to be in the sun. Um, Threadleaf coreopsis. And this one will form uh, a nice cut. It's almost like a small shrub. Like it just sort of spreads out and makes a nice mound covered with these little yellow flowers. Uh, Blue-eyed grass. So this was one of the first ones that volunteered in my yard. At a certain point, I decided I wasn't going to do any more weeding unless I could identify stuff. So it was, it was um, again, one of those mental shifts, but I started letting things grow until they flowered or until I could figure out what they were. You know, once they flower, it tends to be a bit easier. 
And I had this clump of something and I didn't know what it was. And then one day I walked by and I had this just stunning little blue flower. <laughs> I was like, what is this? It's actually not in the grass family, it's an iris, um, but it's a, just a great addition to the, to the garden. Um, there are several different mountain mints. This is a Virginia mountain mint. There's a thread leaf, uh, there's a broad leaf. Um, and again, you know, those mint family, nice long bloom season and they're not gonna get uh, eaten by, by deer and other critters. Um, Ohio spiderwort, uh, I know it can, uh, it can be a little bit aggressive. In my yard, it gets eaten by something. So um, it hasn't taken over, but it has these stunning blue flowers that only live for a day or two. Um, and then we're coming into the later summer season. That middle flower is the broadleaf mountain mint that I mentioned. Um, beautiful silvery foliage. Uh, the anise hyssop on the right. Uh, these, those flower heads at the end of the season become like little finch feeders. Like they're just packed with seeds and the finches, the gold finches just hop from, from flower head to flower head. That's really fun. Uh, and Black Eyed Susan. Uh, it's, Black Eyed Susan is actually a, a biennial. So it's perfect for uh, if you have a new area that trying to kind of fill in with some color and then as other things get more established, it will, it will fade out. Um, of course you have your bee balms. I think Eva's favorite would be that middle a wild bergamot. Um, I love the scarlet. I get a lot of hummingbirds and uh, it's just, a, it's a stunning flower, but I think that spotted bee balm is just spectacular. I mean, it's like little pineapples. It's very tropical looking. The spotted bee balm is a biennial as well. So it will reseed itself, but it, the other two are longer lived perennials. Um, and then we have some bone set being upstaged by an indigo bunting. Um, bone set is, uh, you know, it, it requires sun, but again, it does like a wet area. So if you have a wet uh, corner of your yard, it's perfect for that. And most people are familiar with garden flocks. We, this is another, uh, this is a relative, the meadow flocks, which is just a, a really beautiful um, plant. And coming into the end of the season, um, we have blue mist flower. Uh, which has a really nice long bloom time and is such a, an important late season source of, um, of pollen and nectar. Um, it does spread, it uh, reseeds itself, but it's pretty easy to pull out if, if it shows up where you don't want it. Um, orange coneflower, it's related to the Black Eyed Susan. It's, in the, it's the same Rebecca um, family, but it is a perennial, so it, it's a much longer lived plant and blooms at the end of the season, which is nice um, when things are starting to, to fade a little bit. White snake root volunteers all over my yard. Um, it loves disturbed soil, so it's just like the Black Eyed Susan, it's great for, um, for a shadier area where maybe you pull out some silk grass or something else and you have a um, you know, a, a disturbed area where it's going to take some time for things to fill in, it can kind of fill that gap. And then um, even though it does recede um, itself, it's not really aggressive. So it'll, it'll fall back as other things grow in. Um, and then this Northern Blazing Star, I'm sure most people are familiar with the, the classic um, prairie flower, the um, Blazing Star, Liatra spicata. This one, we, uh, we had put some plants in the ground last spring and kind of forgotten about them. And then in the fall, we were walking around the farm making plans for our fall cleanup. And we came across these, just, uh, these flower stalks that were covered with these gorgeous purple flowers. So this is one I will definitely be adding to my yard. This is the, the Northern version of, a, of the Blazing Star. Uh, and then of course we have, um, Last but not least are goldenrods and asters. And as Eva mentioned, goldenrods, I mean, I think when you look at the lists of like plants by how many insects use them as a host, goldenrods at the top of every list. And there's truly a, a goldenrod for every um, area. I chose this particular one because it doesn't get more than like three feet tall. It's not aggressive. It has these really pretty um, leaves. And um, so sweet goldenrod is great. I mean, there's other ones that get a little bit top, you know, like showy goldenrod and stiff goldenrod and grassy goldenrod, but they do tend to be a little bit taller. Um, an aromatic aster, you know, not too tall, these just bushy plants that are absolutely covered in, in flowers. Um, they're, they're stunning. 
Um, and of course, there's the New England aster, which is the deeper purple, but they do get you know, fairly tall. Um, if you have a shadier area, there's the heartleaf aster, um, which is this pretty lavender. It has a pale green leaf. And the fun thing about this is um, when the flowers first open, they have those cream colored centers. And then once they've been pollinated, they get darker. So you can sort of tell the progress of your plant. Um, there's also the white wood aster, which is another shady aster alternative. Uh, zigzag goldenrod is a goldenrod that is happy to be in the shade. You've probably seen this one out in the woods um, hiking. Uh, another shade goldenrod is the um, blue stem goldenrod. Um, and then just a few of our favorite ground covers. This is the Canada, ane Canada anemone. Um, it is a little bit aggressive, so it can kind of fill in an area. So choose wisely when you're when you're um, putting it in place. Uh, we have pussy toes named because their flowers look like the little cat's paws. Um, this one is a, you know, it does like a little bit of sun. Um, Golden ragwort is one of my favorite ground covers. It, um, it does like a little bit of moisture, but it can take dry if it's not in the sun, if it's in shade. Um, but it fills in very nicely and it has these Cheerful flowers is, again, one of the first things to flower in my yard. It's also almost evergreen. So I think it's really a, a perfect alternative to like a Pachysandra because it's got, you know, it just, it, it, it's, um, it's just a workhorse of a ground cover. Um, a nice pairing here, we have the Jacob's Ladder and Wild Geranium. You know, they flower at roughly the same time. They're very adaptable uh, for sun and soil. They can pretty much work wherever you, wherever you want them to. Um, the common blue violet, I think is a quite underappreciated ground cover. It's, uh, if you're not using herbicides on your lawn, you probably have it in there. Um, and there are, there's a variety that is pink. There's, uh, there are white violets. There are violets with like feathery leaves. There's all sorts of um, violets. It's all, it's a host plant for the great spangled fritillary, uh, just a really uh, underappreciated plant and, and forms a, a wonderful ground cover. Um, and then this Robin's plantain is in the daisy fleabane family and um, has these nice kind of um, uh, fuzzy leaves and isn't evergreen, but, but really does have a presence, you know, through, throughout the year, um, through the cold season. And then last but not least, we have some shrubs, um, witch hazel, which is sort of borderline tree. Um, this, this picture was taken in October. I, it was such a, such a nice surprise to be walking through the woods and come across a, a witch hazel in full bloom. Um, but we have the sweet pepper bush, uh, which is a shrub that it, it likes a moist area. So, um, you know, you may see it if you're walking on a hike where they have like boardwalks, you'll see, um, you'll see clethra um, growing all around there. The dwarf father gilla, I think is another native neighbor, but like many of the native um, trees and shrubs, it flowers before it leaves out. So in the beginning of the spring, you have this shrub that's covered with these like uh, fireworks flowers. Um, and then as they fade, the, the, these leathery textured leaves come in. Uh, New Jersey tea, if you have a, a dry sunny area, it's perfect for that. Um, it gets its name because it was used, I believe as a substitute for black tea during the Revolutionary War. So it's a, an old nickname. Um, sweet fern, uh, named it, sweet because it's fragrant. I think it's sometimes used in potpourri and it's not actually a fern, although it has these fern shaped leaves. Um, it's a nice uh, shrub that will actually form like a, almost like a thicket if it's, if it's happy where you have it. Shrubby St. John's wort. Um, I don't know why this plant isn't in every yard. <laughs> it's such like just a, it's an amazing performer. It's, um, you know, the pollinators love it. It's covered in blooms, really easy to grow and adaptable. And I, um, I am a cheerleader for the shrubby St. John's wort. And last but not least, we have winterberry. Eva talked about the importance of uh, providing berries uh, for birds. Um, so this is one of my favorite. I uh, also love the um, spice bush. 
Um, so, all right. So that's it as far as the specific plants that we wanted to highlight today. And uh, hopefully, yep, yeah, we have about 15 minutes for um, questions if we want to open that up. We had two in the chat. Um, so Terrence was asking, should you always plant milkweed together or can you disperse it around the yard as a standalone? That's, that's a great question. And there's kind of more general question there that about um, bunching things or spacing them around, right? That's kind of popping to my mind because, yeah, so I'm really glad you asked that because there is research that shows that insects notice plants as, as insects are coming, passing by, they notice and stop for plants more readily when they are in clumps instead of, instead of spread out. So that if, uh, so generally an ecological gardening tip is to plant things in clumps of three, if you can, if you have enough room. So, so if you have enough room, you might plant three milkweeds together in a clump over here and then three more over there. But that would be more effective for the, um, for the pollinators than just planting one here and one there. I would just add, when I first started adding native plants to my yard, um, you know how there's people who, birders who, who, who keep a list of all the things they've seen and they're, you know, they're, um, I was doing the same thing with native plants where I was like, oh, I don't have that one. <laughs> and I would add like one of this or two of that. And it was little bits. And it's really hard for, you know, something flying overhead to find if there's only one plant. So I, so there's, so there's the diversity of things you're offering, but then there's also a concept of sufficiency, which is like enough of each thing. And whether they're all together or they're spaced out, unless you have like a critical mass of something there, it's, it's not necessarily going to be found. So I think it's kind of finding the balance of those two. That's an excellent point. Um, Samantha Harvey is asking, can native plants be planted straight into the dirt in your yard or do they need to be in prepared garden beds like vegetables? So generally speaking, I would say like the full sun ones, they are perfectly happy in very lean soils. The ones that are in shadier areas tend to like more of a, a richer, um, you know, they're used to like leaf litter breaking down and creating like a nice rich soil. So I think depending on what you have to start with, um, in some cases, the, you know, the, the meadow type plants are, are not going to do well if you put them in the equivalent of compost. And then Carolyn asks about the tall white beard's tongue and if it is deer resistant. It is. It, it is, is quite yeah. deer resistant. Yeah. yeah, they don't like it. And I would just add to, to what Julie said about the prepared garden beds, just remembering um, how they grow in nature is helpful. And that wild plants um, are used to living on the soils that we have here. So finding the plant that's appropriate to the spot that you already have can be more successful approach than trying to change a spot in order to make it, um, to make it friendly to the plant. So um, thinking about whether a part of your yard is dry or moist, whether water puddles there, or, or runs off um, where the shade is, you know, with the tree roots, is the, soil, is the soil shallow over rocks or not? So there, there, there are native plants that are appropriate to all of those different kinds of conditions and, and finding the right plant for the right spot is actually more important generally than amending the soil. With the exception of like, like Julie said, adding some compost to things to shade loving plants never hurts, but you certainly don't need to, like to prepare entire beds for native plants. I would say that so almost the concept of a bed isn't really <laughs> part of the native plant deal so much. Um, bed, bedding, beds and bedding is, is, um, is sort of a different, um, almost a different aesthetic too. I mean, you can plant, you can plant native plants in beds. If you want to go for a more cultivated look and just use native plants, you totally can. Um, 
But if you want to take a wilder sort of, um, aesthetic, then you can just do you can do away with the idea of beds altogether and try to to stick native plants into your landscape and add to your landscape as they um, where they fit the best. Great. Um, Dassey is asking what maintenance needs do natives have over the growing season? Yeah, I do. Well, I mean, I, I don't I don't do any maintenance. Um, as I said, I, I, I do kind of wander around and like look at things as they pop up to make sure that they're friends. But for the most part, I allow, you know, the plants to do their own thing and some things will you know, it, it's, it's, um, some things will, will kind of spread everywhere and other things will die back, but it's like this very fluid thing. And, and really the only maintenance I do is in my backyard, which I switched over from being a lawn to a meadow in, um, in like late winter, early spring, as, as long as I can make myself wait, I will go out and um, just trim off the very tall stems, you know, you know, waiting until it's been warm enough that hopefully if whoever's in those stems has, has made their way out. Um, but really, you know, I, I don't, I don't do, I, I don't do a lot of maintenance. Part of finding the right spot is that if you put plants that like dry soil in the dry spot, then you shouldn't have to water them. Um, after the first year, everything to get established likes you know some water, but after that, they really should be able to live on their own. And then the ones that like the wet spot, you put them there. So, and then it's also great to be gardening in layers, so that rather than using mulch, you're using a green mulch, right? You're using ground covers and uh, things that will kind of grow below and in between and around. And that way, you're not doing a lot of weeding. You're not adding mulch. You're not you know, developing a very thick layer of mulch where things can't reseed themselves. Um, the more you use plant material, the less maintenance you have to do. The one, the one thing that's really important for every gardener in Westchester though, is to get familiar with the worst invasives because everybody, no matter how, um, how tightly woven your, your garden is, um, they're going to be some invasives that are going to make their way in and they 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 come with birds you know like birds eat berries and they'll poop them out and then you've got bittersweet um or barberry and um some of those plants are very hard to get rid of once they they're they're hard to get rid of once they grow bigger because their roots are deep and then then you have to work hard to get rid of them so it's really good to just get to know the worst invasives, what they look like when they're little. And Learn your cotyledons. <laughs> yeah, well, it could be a little bigger than the cotyledons, but you know, like, like, like it's, it's, it's nice to go around every spring and just pull out your baby bittersweets and your baby right. barberries, you know, before they get um, harder to manage. So we, we put up on our website, the nursery website, we just put up, a, started a photo library of some of the worst invasives and what they look like when they're little. Um, That's great. Yeah. Um, Alicia is asking about growing things from seeds or plugs and which is generally better for planting natives. How patient are you? <laughs> I mean, the wonderful thing about native plants is you can grow them from seed. They probably won't flower until their second summer, but they're, um, but it's very easy to winter sow them. You, you, you can actually put them in a, like a recycled plastic container clear enough that you can see your hand through couple inches of soil, put the seeds in, close it up and put it out. I have a hundred plus milk jugs on my porch. Um, and so they're very easy to grow, but those plants won't be full size flowering plants until next summer. Um, you know, you can shortcut by getting plugs. And I think plugs are also great if, um, you know, in plants that take like a, like Baptisia, something that, that takes multiple years to start. It's nice to kind of shorten the process, but um, I mean, I, I, I'm a huge advocate of growing native plants from seed. And also ecologically, if you're ordering, if you, there, there are some wonderful companies that sell beautiful plants and plug cases, but every time you order those, they come in a whole lot of plastic that cannot be recycled. None of the black plastic in the nursery trade can be recycled. 
So if you plant from seed yourself in a recycled milk jug or just right out in the soil, you're avoiding that. Excellent, excellent point. Um, Mary Jo was asking about your seed swap group, uh, Julie, and was interested in, in that. Yeah, so that group, um, we've sort of partnered the last couple of years with uh, Bedford 2030 and done a seed swap in the fall in Bedford Hills and a winter sewing workshop in January um, for people who don't mind braving the cold. Um, mm -hmm. So what was initially started as its own kind of standalone, uh, now there's a bunch of groups that are that are doing that together. There is a Facebook group um, that is called, it's called like Westchester Native Plant and Seed Swap, I think very creative. Um, but the primary gathering, so, you know, COVID kind of made it a little harder to do stuff in person, but our, our the last two years, our primary thing has been, has been that Bedford 2030 um, partnership. Great. Um, Alicia asks, is there anything one should avoid planting near a well or septic tank, anything with extremely deep roots that we might want to worry about? Um, yeah, I mean, anything, yes, anything with deep roots. So there, there is a list. If you can plant a meadow over a septic tank uh, if you want to. It's a nice, since it's, people are supposed to keep their septic tanks you know, area clear, um, you can plant a meadow over it, but there are certain plants to avoid. And if you, um, Alicia, if you're interested in getting a list, I'd be, I've researched that a little bit. I'd be happy to send it to you. I will just, I'm just going to type my, let me just type my personal email into the, into the chat right here. You can email me and I'll, I'll send you a list of good meadow plants for septic. Um, Mary Jo is asking if any of the plants that were discussed are especially poisonous to children or animals. Yeah, there's, there's the white snake root that kills Abraham Lincoln's mother. Oh my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> right. The, the sheep, she that. drank the milk that the sheep, she, she, she drank the milk that the sheep had eaten, that had eaten the white snake root. It's that poisonous. Oh my goodness. Yeah. And uh, yeah. Um, but it grows like, it's so grows everywhere. You may have it in your yard already. That one, that one recedes like crazy, I must say. What else is especially poisonous, Julie? I think, I mean, milkweed is poisonous, I believe, right. um, it's unless like you a cook kid, it. But if you're worried about like a kid eating it, nobody would because it's really bitter also. Yeah. yeah. And that's sort of the wonderful thing about a lot of poisonous plants is that they are bitter and that's that's why they're bitter, right? It's, it's a warning, luckily. Right. Um, yep. Steer your kid toward the mint. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> teach them to make tea. Um, Anne is asking what plants are especially good for ground or green mulching? Um, so, I mean, I think it depends on what you're putting them under. Uh, so, you know, some things like sink foil or wild strawberry are really good at just kind of like weaving their way underneath um, much taller plants, um, you know, other, other plants. I, I think it, the short answer is it, it depends um, it really depends on the on the circumstances and and um, you know finding whether it's a clumping ground cover or one that spreads through rhizomes or through stolen like you just have to kind of mix and match. Shoshana is asking, what do you suggest would work well around a tree with visible roots in an area where water can pool? So somebody that sounds like a perfect place for pakara, doesn't it, Julie? It does. yes. 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 Pakara loves water. Yeah. Yeah, and it's kind of shallow rooted. So so you want something like that right there, I think. And then clam B, are many of the plants featured in your presentation available from your nursery? Yeah, they are. <laughs> One would hope. Are. <laughs> yeah, they are. Excellent. Excellent. Um, and I also am, you know, cognizant of time. I know it's 757. I also did unmute folks, but I was working my way through what was in the chat. But if anyone has other questions that are on the top of your head and you would like to unmute yourself and ask a, a last question or two, but then we'll, uh, we'll say our, our thanks and our goodbyes. But don't be shy. I'm impressed. You've done it. <laughs> no one right. has burning questions. 
Good mm -hmm. timing. Excellent. Well, thank you both so much. This was really lovely. Thank you for inviting us. It's really good yeah. to be sort of back at T Town, even though I'm sitting here in my study. But but still, <laughs> <laughs> to have the connection, to have that connection is is great. And yeah. since we're like so close to spring too, it was fun to look at all these plants and know that they're just around the corner. <laughs> Exactly. And, and sort of, as I said in my email to everyone sending out that link, it was sort of nice to be thinking about all this when the snow was coming down today. So yeah. it was helpful. <laughs> we are bringing a little away. warmth in. T-Town, I would just want to say to such a beautiful example right around, around the buildings of ecological gardening too, such beautiful, beautiful plantings, mixtures of shrubs and natives and some non-natives, but, and all just, um, a delight for a delight to look at as well as habit as well as habitat for critters so next time you're there come uh, take you, notes come, come take, take pictures notes. exactly <laughs> take, yeah exactly all right well thank you everyone and uh keep an eye out for future programming we'll be in touch and have a lovely evening <laughs>